This is Coda Radio, episode 309 for November 30th, 2020. Friends and welcome into Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and the world of technology. This episode is brought to you by Cloud Guru. There's so many career possibilities in the cloud and so little time. ACG's learning paths help you take the right courses to prepare for architect, developer, security, and many other high-paying cloud jobs. Get hired, get certified, get learning at cloudguru.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week, fighting off the swamp monsters, and keeping it all together, it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. Hello. Hello, sir. I congratulate you on surviving the holiday week. Never easy on the small businessman or lady out there. So congratulations for getting through and uh, yes, and trucking on, trucking on. You know, even if you yourself don't particularly celebrate a holiday that others are observing, it's still a disruption to just the flow of business and routine. Yep. Which has knock-on effects that then make like the return week not as effective. Like for me, it was people weren't, it's just kind of around Wednesday stopped responding to emails. Yeah. Took me a little bit. I was like, oh, I have, no, I got to wait till Monday now <laughs> before I get this taken care of. Thanksgiving is pretty much the worst holiday for small businesses because nobody's working that beginning of that week. Really, everybody's thinking about their plans, whatever. Everybody takes the Friday, Friday off. off. Yeah. And it's like, well, we got nothing done. And then it, to compound it, Christmas, uh, like the week before and after Christmas is a total disaster, too. It's both good and bad because then you have quiet time if you utilize it right. But what happens to me is I'm so heads down. I'm go, 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 go. And then all of a sudden I get there and all, there's this just this lack of like preparedness for this downtime. And now I just have this downtime that I didn't plan for. And I, I don't know how to use it effectively. <laughs> Does this ever happen to you? All the time. All the time. <laughs> Were you sneaking away to get tea while I was? <laughs> I think I caught you. And it's the worst because I'm sitting there. I finally get some time off. I finally get some downtime. But instead, I'm kicking myself for not properly utilizing. Like, for me, I could be traveling or, you know, in the RV. Or I, I, I could be working on a home project or, or, or something for a future episode. And I usually end up watching a movie. But I actually ended up having a really good Thanksgiving. The smoked turkey went off really well. Um, the prototype and then the beta turkey were extremely necessary, and production turkey turned out fabulous. I did not smoke any laptops, so <laughs> good. take the win. Well, let's get into some feedback, as uh, we do here on the show. And um, we're going to take a moment to talk about keyboards, thanks to Not John. He says, I know you guys have talked about DOS keyboard in the past, and I wonder if you have seen DOS keyboard Q. Have you seen this, Mike? I did today. <laughs> I'm going to play a little bit of their promo video, which has perfectly good audio, uh, to explain what this thing is. But think of it as a mechanical keyboard with LED light-up keys that are programmable for your notifications. We'd like to introduce our all-new DOS Keyboard 5Q. It's going to revolutionize the way you gather and track the information you care about by transforming your keyboard into a dashboard keyboard. And you will never want an input-only keyboard after this. Are you an over-tapper? Do your web browsers look like this? Which one of these is my inbox? How many notifications do you get in a day? How long before you just start ignoring them all? The things you want to know can easily get drowned out by all the other stuff out there. And it's made information gathering kind of a pain. But fear not over tabbers and alert snoozers. DOS Keyboard is developing a new kind of keyboard that's going to change all of that. DOS Keyboard 5Q is an RGB LED keyboard that's software driven and allows you to customize the color and pattern of every key based on the information that you actually want to follow. Instead of relying on snoozable momentary alerts from different devices, DOS Keyboard 5Q allows you to ambiently track subtle changes to data over time without actively seeking updates or constantly receiving new alerts, which frees you up to work all right, you can, you know, you get an RGB selector, you can select a color and a notification pulse for a region of keys or a single key for a type of notification. So this kind of feels like that couple weeks I tried Vim, right? <laughs> like it seems like it'd be a great idea, you can customize it, but you end up just like working on your setup and not doing your actual work. Talk about a total toy for that, right? You're so right. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is tempting, honestly, when I saw you put it in the dock, I was like, 
maybe I could use the new keyboard, right? But but I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts? First of all, when they say a software app that you use to program the buttons, I first I worry that it's going to be crap, and then I also think it's probably not going to work on Linux. But um, beyond that, I don't think this is the direction for me. And I was once the uh, the guy that wanted that OLED keyboard where all of the buttons were a, a programmable OLED screen. And uh, I was the guy who wanted to get the Logitech keyboard that has an LCD screen built into it with a Linux box that like connects to your machine and shows you system stats or plays video on a keyboard screen. I mean, I have been down this road and now I'm kind of on the other end of it. I have to be honest, what I like now are elegant, simple, mechanical keyboards that are really nice to type on really well built and depending on my requirements in at least in, at least at home small and it's it's actually kind of hard to find a small mechanical keyboard that still has decent arrow keys and function keys a lot of them are like these 60% keyboards and they drop the arrow keys and I'm not having that I'm not having the, no arrow keys so I I landed about a year and a half ago on the Vortex Race 3 mechanical keyboard. And I'll have a link in the show notes. It's about $140. And God bless it, Mike. It's one of the best little keyboards I've ever used in my 35 years of using keyboards. And I'm saying, like, I love, like, the IBM PS2 keyboards. These are This is a real nice to type on keyboard. You can get it with whichever kind of key you prefer. And... It's super compact. It has 83 keys, so it's got uh, the arrow keys. It also comes with a couple of optional keys that you can pop off and replace, so it has some color, which is nice. So, like, the delete keys and escape key are red. Alt can be blue. Shift is green. Just kind of helps catch the eye, but it also just comes with all one color if that's what you prefer. It's also a metal casing, which is a nice CNC aluminum that feels really high quality. And then it has what it calls layers. Now, get your brain noggin out for this one, Mike, these programmable layers allow you to, in the keyboard firmware, map like Mac mode, PC mode, all these different options that um, you can just, by a key combo, activate. And then it has an LED light that kind of lights up to indicate which layer it's on. So the code mechanical keyboard that I used, which I think was made by WASD, also has this concept. And this is for like guys like us who bounce between OSs all the time. Really nice. And and the the vortex is nice and small. It's it's been super reliable. It's not wireless, uh, which would be kind of nice. But I also appreciate not having to fuss with uh, with batteries ever. So I'm going to put your code keyboard in the in the show notes too. There are things I would prefer. I I would like a wireless option, and I would like it to light up. Mm. And vortex does make a version of the race three that lights up, but the keycaps aren't transparent. They're not see through, so it's just under key lighting. Not really quite what I'm looking for. It's, it's. I'm surprised it took me this long to find a good keyboard in 2020 that worked for my situation, that wasn't massive, that feels really good to type on. You know, it's one of those keyboards where I, even a year, year and a half into it, I sit down and I still really enjoy typing on it and I feel like I can type really fast. Now, is this full sized? I'm looking at your Vortex. I want to say it's like a 70% keyboard or a 65% keyboard. So it's not, okay. and that's one of the things I really appreciate about it is in a small space. I don't have a lot of room at home. It, it doesn't take up, and it fits in a backpack. And I've actually just brought it with me in the backpack before, and it totally does fine. Don't worry. I've got my own keyboard. <laughs> yeah. Is that like have gun will travel, have keyboard? Yeah. yeah. I Actually, what I did for a little while is I made a virtualization bag where I had a portable HDMI 1080p monitor. I had this keyboard, and I had a ThinkPad ThinkStation Thunderbolt 3 dock with an NVIDIA graphics card in it. And what was so great about this is you take that one Thunderbolt 3 cable and you pass it through to the VM software for hardware pass-through, and everything on the dock now shows up to the virtual OS. So the physical USB ports, the NVIDIA graphics card, the SD card slot reader, all of it shows up to the virtualized guest and it gets direct access to it. And so I would hook up a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse, and I would use a virtual machine through a Thunderbolt 3 dock connected back to my laptop. 
And that was some serious virtualization. That's nuts. I don't think you, I think my, honestly, if you sat down at it, you would have no idea it was a VM. You could work on it all day long and really have no idea because it had dedicated GPU and you were using a dedicated monitor and keyboard and mouse. I'm a little jealous. I know. Sometime you come out here to the Pacific Northwest, we'll geek out for a bit. Yes. I saw, maybe even go down the block at one point. It's coming soon. Maybe. Maybe one day. One day. Uh, if, you have, if you have some keyboard solutions, it, uh, honestly, something that's wireless, that lights up with keys that you can actually see when the lights are on, um, and is about like the Vortex 3 that I've linked in the show notes, or any other kind of keyboards that have kind of changed your game, do let us know. Uh, coder.show slash contact. I would like to uh, I would like to geek out on that with you hmm. because I'm really really happy with mine, but I've I can tell there is some room for improvement um, for some of the basics. Oh, there's always room for tooling improvement. That's true. That's exactly. I think that's a long running theme of this show. Listener Mike, so not this Mike, wrote in. He says, "Guys, what does the world come to when portability is one of your primary reasons for buying a new machine? What kind of companies are paying developers to spend so many hours in meetings or on airplanes?" Granted, some devs like computers that are easy to tow back and forth. But then again, I ask you, what has this world come to? I think that's kind of directed at you, Mr. Laptop Purchaser. Can't imagine why. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I've always found laptops to be a bad value, but a necessary evil. Granted, you know, 2020, sure. But that aside, I, I don't know. You have to give presentations. You have to go on site, right? So when I got this email, when I was, you know, reading this this morning, because I batched him before the show, I was thinking, you know what else it is, Mike, that we don't really implicitly state often is both you and I are also the boss. We're also the CEO. Yeah. We're landing sales. So we're the lead sales engineer or whatever you want to call it. It's not just the pure development. There's also the team management aspect, the sales management aspect, the company management aspect. And that does demand some portability. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Google Docs, right, doing presentations or whatever. No wonder you're not feeling so good. If you were going to clone PowerPoint, you could have put someone other than the intern on it. That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Josh writes in with a quickie. Uh, I just listened to 389 and I wanted to make a comment about the M1 and Rosetta 2. Part of me feels that unless Apple puts an end of life on Rosetta 2, developers are just going to ignore the new architecture and just build their apps for x86. It runs good enough. Similar to how Proton is being utilized for Windows games on Linux and developers are now avoiding porting their games. Just wanted to add my two cents. Thanks for the entertainment on my way to work. Josh, do you think this is going to be an issue at all on the Apple platform? Apple is going to eventually flip the switch in Xcode or whatever you know their tools are, You know the command line version of Xcode. And... Uh, I'm sorry, the Xcode command line tools. God, that's naming. And they're going to force you. There's also going to be a race to like make interesting M1 apps. Sure, Adobe is going to be stubborn, whatever, big companies. But of all the things I would be worried about with the M1, it's not, it's not this. Apple's going to swing the hammer. Completely agree. I think what you'll see happen is two years after the last Intel Mac ships, they'll shut it down. And they'll remove it from the current version of Mac OS at that time. Just like they did with the PowerPC transition. Two years, I think it was, after the last PowerPC Mac sold, uh, that version of Mac OS didn't include Rosetta. When we go to Mac OS Little Tyke or whatever the next version is going to be, <laughs> they're just going to say, if you have Intel, you, you know, whenever they do this, right, they're just, that version's not going to work on Intel Macs. Yeah, exactly. And what do you think of this? Uh, you know, you're seeing more and more people now concerned that. Apple is really going to create a locked-in ecosystem that they'll be able to ratchet down more and more. What? Apple? Locking down? Come on! I actually have a bit of a counter view on it. I'm not as concerned about it, but I wanted to give you a first shot at it. I mean, yeah, it's a proprietary design, isn't it? Like always, though, uh, the Mac has been a proprietary design. I mean, it does make it more appealing one. I think that's really the underlying uncomfortableness, is that there is a big competitive advantage that they have right now with speed and performance. And I think it makes people a little uncomfortable because it's going to more people buy it because of that. And it means more people will be locked into an ecosystem that's very expensive, semi-user hostile at times. And when I say semi-user hostile, I mean in such that and for good and bad, Intel will move the platform forward. Like Mike answered that question about Rosetta 2 being aged out with absolute confidence. And that's that's actually, if you think about it, pretty significant. It's kind of important that your developers, developers going into this right now in 2020, when we've only got a handful of M1 Macs, they already know what the game is. 
as Mike just demonstrated, they already know that ultimately they're going to have to port. Yeah. And there's, it's just, it's just the way Apple runs the ship for better or for worse. I think that sometimes results in leaving some users behind. If you look at like my family members and friends who have some older Macs, uh, I feel really bad. You know, it's hard for them to understand where the line's drawn on what Macs are supported and what isn't supported and what that means. It's not really clear like it is on the Windows platform. It's it's very clear what, what Windows is supported and what applications run on what versions of Windows. But when you're kind of not really familiar with this stuff and say you're buying a used Mac on eBay, which is extremely common for the average consumer who maybe doesn't have Apple money, but they still want the Mac experience. They get something that's no longer supported and they can't even put the latest OS on it or get the latest apps and they just don't understand what's going on. Um, and so that can be somewhat user hostile, but at the same time, it's how Apple moves the platform forward. So I sort of don't get all the hand wringing about the M1, right? You can't ask them to make a shittier product, right? You can't ask them to not make it proprietary. True. So I don't get it. Like it, it does suck to be Dell right now, right? Like, but I'm my expectation is that the industry is just going to have to catch up, and like Apple's not going to be dominant with this. They, they have a you were right. They have a quite an advantage right now, but I don't see that. I guess as a permanent thing. Well, and interestingly, there is already uh, people working to get Linux on there. Linus was asked about it, and he said he'd absolutely love to have Linux on an M1 MacBook. He, in fact, he kind of makes them a dig. He says, you know, Apple runs Linux in their cloud. But their laptops don't. However, some entrepreneurial developers like Hector Martin have been digging into this. And it seems Apple has left a user controllable option for their secure boot setup that allows the user to override the default mode and essentially boot any OS they want on the ARM Max. That's massive. Um, and so Hector Martin's actually looking at launching a Patreon. He's got some experience in this area. He's thinking about launching a Patreon to get funding to start working on porting Linux to the M1. <laughs> so maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't be such a lockdown platform. But I think ultimately what I hope will happen, and I said this before the announcement even, is that I hope that it will encourage some companies. This, I should say, Apple's move here combined with NVIDIA's purchase of ARM, shall we not forget that just recently happened, mm. I think is going to bode well for RISC-V long-term and open platforms like Open Power PC which ultimately will benefit everyone. It's just we needed a couple of things to push it because so far the x86 dominance has been quote-unquote good enough for so long that no one's been really compelled to solve this problem. But now with NVIDIA and Apple, we've got two really good reasons to start working on other solutions, and I think it will just naturally start to happen. It'll just take a little time to get there. Right, and your GNOME extensions will still crash your whole system. So <sighs> I had to. No, it's fair. I, I, I've been having problems this morning. Yeah. And having problems this morning. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm honestly feeling like maybe I really am getting close to new machine time. Um, so why don't we take a moment, speaking of that, and thank System76. System76.com. If you've been thinking about getting a new rig, there's probably never been a better time to get a System76 machine. It's their merry 15th birthday sale. Now, until January 4th, you can get a great deal when you upgrade. You save on laptops and desktops. It's their birthday, but you get the good deals. And this means I've been a System76 customer for 15 years. That is mind-blowing. And they have some of their best machines. Well, they do. They just hands down do. I mean, the Thalia workstation, which recently just got the Mega, which looks amazing. But you might have your eye on a laptop. And this sale could be the perfect opportunity. The Galago Pro starts at under $1,000. And it has an 11th gen Intel Core i5 or i7 CPU. But here's the really impressive thing. You're not going to believe it when you see how thin this laptop is. And it starts at three pounds. That's the base weight, three pounds. But you can get an optional NVIDIA GTX 1650 in that thing. Up to two terabytes of PCIe 4 NVMe storage. And of course, it's loaded with System76's open firmware. So you know it's going to be easy to manage. You have some faith and trust in its security. But also, it boots super fast. That's what you'll notice on the day-to-day -day usage. And even if you load this thing up with multiple disks, the i7, the optional NVIDIA GTX card, it's still going to be a super light portable laptop with great battery life. And this has never been a better time with their sale. Also, if you're looking for battery life, check out the Lemur Pro. That has 14 hours of battery life. 
It's remote workers bliss. If you need to get out of the house from time to time and you need some battery life, the lemur is the way to go. But man, that Galago Pro, that is so tempting with that optional NVIDIA card. <sighs> man, that's the, that's the one I'd pull the trigger on right now if I were getting a System76 laptop. Check out the Thaleos too if you want the desktop line. There's, I mean, they're just gorgeous. They're gorgeous machines. And you can get a discount because it's their birthday. The Merry 15th birthday sale at System76.com. And go there when you check out, tell them the Coda Radio program sent you. Say they demanded I buy a Galago Pro. <laughs> System76.com. And happy Merry birthday to you guys over there. System76.com. And thanks for sponsoring the Coda Radio program. Well, the big hoopla is right now, as you and I talk, the speculation is that Slack is going to sail to Salesforce. Slack is what? What am I trying to say? <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Slack's going to sell. This seems like a shit deal, to tell you the truth. And I'm not happy about it. No, I, I, I hate Salesforce. Like, <laughs> having been their customer once, they are a bunch of D bags. It looks like it's going to go for a, a fair amount of money. It seems like maybe somewhere in the 25, 24, 20 billion range, which is pretty, pretty good. Microsoft rumored uh, to offer eight billion in 2016. Um, when Slack said no, that's sort of when they said, "All right, we're going to start on Teams." And now here we are, and Slack is selling. And a bit ironic because I don't know if you recall, but they made that dear Microsoft post where they yeah. condescendingly welcomed Microsoft to the revolution and said they were glad that they'd helped give them a little competition. And uh, and they said, "quote We sh we're sure you're going to come up." with a couple of new ideas on your own too. And we'll be right there and ready. I forgot about that. That was it's embarrassing. Almost like something I would do. That's like crazy. <laughs> it's just like, you know, they were feeling like they'd turned down the sale and Microsoft had announced, you know, what they were going to do. And Slack knew the backstory at that point. I, I guess they were feeling brazen and they were feeling on top of the world. But the reality is, I, I don't think they've really managed to leverage the pandemic, for a lack of a better term, like Zoom and Teams have. Well, I was going to say, you know, because Teams and Zoom just like ate their cupcake, right? Yeah. Zoom's a problem here too, right? Zoom's grown to 300 million, 300 million daily active participants, which is ginormous. And then, of course, Teams is bundled with Office 365 and has 32 million daily active users. And functional PowerPoint. Yeah. And the new number is 115 million as of last month. Slack stopped updating their daily active user number last year when they reached 12 million. So we don't actually know what Slack's active millions are. But I'm sure it's more than 12, though. But 115 is off of 365 and 300 million daily active Zoomers. And that had to have been a factor for Slack as well. Why does Salesforce want them just to buy it? Because it's like it just doesn't seem to go with the rest of Salesforce's offerings. That's funny. That's what the analysis that I saw on CNBC before the show was saying is that it's like, oh, really? Not really. The funny because one of the guys is like, yeah, I have some Salesforce stock and I am not happy about this because this is just going to be a hard merger. It's going to be extremely difficult to integrate these in, in, a, in a way that doesn't e it does either just doesn't work or just doesn't ruin Slack. Or it's one of these leave them totally independent and then it's like, what's the point of dropping 25 bill? Right, because like, how are you going to integrate like their CRM and their data services with Slack? I mean, I guess you can, but you can already do that now. I don't get it. I don't get it either. And I'm, I got to be honest, man. I'm, I'm really disappointed that when the lockdowns hit and the stay-at-home orders hit, it was Zoom and Teams that reap the benefits, and and not things like Jitsi or or even Slack, because at least they're an independent small company. I mean, no shade over to our friends that listen at Microsoft, but I've used Teams. I've used Teams. It's no Slack. We've all used Teams. And, you know, if you're a file-centric, if you're a SharePoint, former SharePoint or still SharePointers, yep. uh, you're a big one driver, all, it makes a lot of sense if you're in that. Active Directory. Yep, yep. If you're in that ecosystem, it makes a lot of sense, and it just works. You know, it's one of the things about Microsoft products is individually on their own, some of them are okay, some of them are good. Some of them are not so good, like a lot of their corporate stuff. But it all works together. It's all centrally administered. It's really kind of the whole that makes it an, a, a, an appealing product. And when COVID hit, they just started handing out teams like for crazy for free to, to anybody that would take it. This maybe is a little mean, but I kind of think that Slack 
wasn't able to leverage it because their video offering, their call off. Have you ever done that? Um, I've I've used it for like meetings and stuff. It's super, at least for us, it's super rough. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. And there's no way to like add and like make it a call where external folks can come in. So we have to have that and Google Meet. Yes. Yes. Right. So it's like, I mean, we have Google anyway, but it's one of those obvious features that you would think they would have developed, but instead they want to have like mixed workspaces. I don't know. I have lots of complaints about Slack, but we... Yeah, and the mixed works mixed workspaces thing requires a paid account for some functionality you can get from free for other stuff or in dedicated apps. Yep. And they've struggled to make that really a value. And I have to be honest, I was, I've never really been uh, super comfortable with Slack. The backstory for JB is Slack became a product at literally the right moment in time where we were having a conversation about needing a way to collaborate on a couple of projects and it was one of those, we're way behind, we got to get moving, what are we going to do? Oh, hey, there's this thing. In a few clicks, we now have a free chat environment. And over the years, a lot of great open source alternatives have popped up. But we had gone all in at that point on Slack, and it was a settled deal. And then as the industry adoption and network effect took off, it just sort of reinforced the choice and made it harder and harder to, to move away. But as I've sort of rebooted, and we're doing JB 3.0 now, I got to really question that. I, a... The cost is outrageous. It's like $12 a month. And, and and the whole idea is bringing as many people in to collaborate, right? So screw you. You're going to be paying out the nose. You're going to be paying several hundred dollars a month to use this product. Give me a break. And the reality is there's just so many other self-hosted options now that I think with this acquisition, it just sort of seals the deal. Now it's more of a get it on the schedule and figure it out kind of thing. Yeah. And I guess so long to the network effect, which does come up, you know, that's going to be something... I've already been thinking about the emails I'm going to have to send saying, hey, look, we're dropping Slack, and so we're going to have to leave your little cross Slack thingy. And it'll be just a little awkward, but I just I can't do it anymore. And if they're part of Salesforce, just give me a break. That's what I was going to say. Like, you know, Salesforce isn't going to not try to pull you into the rest of the ecosystem, right? I mean, why else buy them? I think I've had it. I've had it. You know, I've just had it with this crap. I've had it with these services yeah. that are one thing for a while and then they either get sold or they need to, they, you know, they need to change how they generate revenue and the, the deal changes. I've just, I've had it with that kind of thing. There does seem to be a theme going through the last however many for years between the show of an inability to get like medium sized independent businesses that don't just either get crushed or gobbled up by the big guys. Well, and don't forget the VC kind of uh, thing, too, that's been huge since the show started and just mm -hmm. really exploded, which is these VC companies, which I didn't really fully appreciate until I recently had some hands-on experience. They're, they're really kind of set on a trajectory. When you inject tens of millions of dollars into a company, it fundamentally alters everything. And, and it, it sets the requirements differently. I mean, it just – I guess I didn't really understand that fully. I got it conceptually, but then witnessing the difference – was really educating. And I think that's played a big factor in too, why we've seen these medium-sized companies try to sort of come up out of nowhere and then either pop or sell. Or be destroyed, like once again, poured out for sun. Yeah, or get acquired. That's often their absolute best case scenario is one of the big five tech companies acquires them. I know a VC uh, down in the St. Petersburg, Tampa area here. And his first question to folks pitching him now is, who are you going to sell to? Yeah. Like it, that's, that is the first question. Because the IPO is just such a long shot right it's now. It's such a long shot. It takes so long. And I, the, just like you know, Slack was going to want to, or Microsoft wanted to buy Slack, Slack said no. So Microsoft just, you know, IE cloned it, right? Right. It reminds me of Jobs trying to buy Dropbox. And when they said no, they said, well, we're just going to build it ourselves then. You know what? iCloud drive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dropbox is still better. I know. <laughs> yeah. I keep trying to quit Dropbox and it just pulls me right back in. Damn it. But it is it is it is true that it it just I guess it was I almost feel now looking back at it if this this by the way we're talking about this like it's happened because this show's supposed to come out a day after its news so we don't actually know at the time we're recording but it looks like a pretty sure bet a lot it's multiple sources a lot of smoke it seems like it's a sure bet and looking at it now I feel almost kind of naive for not expecting this yeah like how could I not see it coming. All right, let's move on, because it just upsets me so much, and it gets me on my open source uh, soapbox. And, yeah, but yeah, the therapy session, right? And then everybody has to, you know, hear, hear me get worked up. So let's talk about something good. Amazon 
freaking loves rust in like a in like a we're putting money where our mouth is kind of love and like i can't sleep you know refreshing rust's facebook page over and over again sort of way <laughs> Yeah, awkwardly snocking. Uh, AWS has announced its intention to hire more Rust developers in the coming months. They've dedicated one of their managers to uh, basically taking this on to just hiring Rust engineers. Shane Miller, a senior software engineering manager at AWS, has been tasked with hiring Rust engineers. Uh, she explained the importance of Rust AWS. She says, quote, Rust is a critical component of our long-term strategy, and we're investing to deliver Rust engineering at Amazon scale. That includes developer tools, infrastructure components, interoperability, and verification. They currently have 120 Rust-related vacancies, damn. spanning software development, hardware development, support engineering, and system security engineering. And I'll, I'll link in the show notes to um, an article that just talks about a handful of some of the apps at Amazon now that are using Rust or large components are written in Rust. Then they went on to say on their own blog, it uh, was Matt Assay on their main blog wrote that, uh, let's be clear, we understand that we are net beneficiaries of the exceptional work that others have done to make Rust thrive. AWS didn't start Rust or make it the success it is today, but we'd like to contribute to its future success. We are convinced that investing in the wider Rust ecosystem helps our customers and those who may never become our customers. And that's okay. That's how open source is supposed to work. Uh, and then Miller adds, we're not just hiring a couple of folks. Rust is a critical component of our long-term strategy, and we're investing to deliver Rust engineering at Amazon scale. Then they highlight that uh, they're trying to support the Rust community in other ways and even outside of hiring, and that there has been more than 5,500 contributors to Rust since its inception, with an average of 330 contributors to each release. And then they end it by saying they're grateful to be part of this welcoming, productive Rust community. Kumbaya, Mike. <laughs> they, have, yeah, they have some Rust love. Crab people. Crab. <laughs> Seriously, they're, the cr Rust stations are growing strong. Didn't, didn't Apple just do a thing like this, too? They were like, we love Rust. Yes, and Microsoft as well. 1.0 was out in 2015. I mean, this is us. This is this is quite the. If you got on Rust in 2015, there's some seriously significant jobs out there for you at this point. It sounds like. Honestly, I, I think it's gonna keep going this way. Oh, it's also Stack Overflows when they do their Stack Overflow developer survey and they survey survey like 65,000 <laughs> developers. Uh, Rust is the was rated the most loved programming language on the list <laughs> okay so there you go yeah so i don't know i don't really have much with that no i think it's interesting that it, yeah and that it's becoming a standard right uh we'll have a link in the show notes if you're interested in some of that maybe you can contribute i don't know maybe you can go get a job at amazon if you do let us know feedback on any of these coder.show slash contact and of course the links like i just mentioned to coder.show slash three nine zero I mentioned last week, but I, you know, I should have done this at the top of the show. We have a Black Friday sale for the Coder QA team, and it's two bucks off, which is a great deal. You just use the coupon code Black Friday. So go to coderqa.co, that's coderqa.co, and use the coupon code Black Friday, and you get two bucks off. And with that, you get the warm feeling of supporting the show and keeping us independent, a limited ad feed, so that way you get more of what you love and less of what you don't. And you get the uh, Coderly report which will be coming out kind of soonish. That'll be soon. Something we'll put on our radars. And while I'm talking about Black Friday sales, be sure to check out a Cloud Guru's Black Friday sale. It's their annual Black Friday sale, and it's your last chance for the lowest price this year. So get the fast track to the cloud with the most effective and comprehensive cloud learning platform. There's never been a better time to learn the cloud, and a Cloud Guru's annual Black Friday sale is your last chance for low prices this year. So take advantage of it. To get access to the tools you need to succeed in the cloud, Check out a Cloud Guru's deal. We'll have a link in the show notes. You can manage your cloud learning program at scale by taking advantage of their business annual plans for your team. Now for $100 off. It's perfect for any size team. So take advantage of your last chance to get the discount this year. It is their annual Black Friday sale. And you got to use the link in the show notes to get that. Again, that's coder.show slash 390. 
Well, Mr. Dominic, I've made my decision and I've pulled the trigger on the X1. It is on the way. It'll be in the mail. Nice. I have literally no idea what I'm going to do. I was I was determined to just run Fedora. That's why I bought it. For years now, I've been buying machines preloaded with Ubuntu. And I thought, well, let's give it a go. For the first time ever, I can buy one preloaded with Fedora. And that just, that that means something to me as a longtime desktop advocate. But I'm not sure. Ultimately, what, if I'll keep it on there or not, we'll see. I'm not sure what I'll do. I'm not sure if I'm going to dual boot Windows on there. I'm just, I, everything's on the table right now. The whole, the whole setup. And I've got, um, I'm kind of rethinking my whole desk setup. That's why the keyboard's also kind of on the table. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to get a monitor mount. I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a Visa laptop mount that mounts to that monitor stand and uh, I can put the Ooh, laptop on there. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think I'm going to get another 1440p screen to connect with that. Because I like at least two monitors when I'm working. I'm gonna I'm gonna just try to really get myself set up for working from home in a way that's comfortable because right now it's it's bonkers. And I don't think that's gonna be wrapping up anytime soon. And if I can make my home setup just a little bit better for a reasonable price, I think it's time to do it. Should have done it a while ago, to be honest with you. But I just I really have been on the fence uh, about what hardware to get. But ultimately I've I I've made my decision and I, I thought about it some more and I I've had some conversations and I, I thought the opportunity to buy a machine loaded with Fedora from the vendor directly, that was just that was such a neat opportunity. I wanted to pull the trigger on it. So when I get it and I've had a chance to try it for a little bit, I'll let you know what I think about it as a as a piece of hardware. As uh, as Nick in the chat room says, obviously, it's going to run Suze. <laughs> <laughs> you notice the feedback's dropped off. I noticed the, the lizards have, have withdrawn. I guess they feel like they've had their victory. Yes. But uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um have you tried SUSE as a desktop? I did not care for it. <laughs> what? How outrageous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, fair enough. Um, well, Mr. Dominic, is there anything you want to mention this week before we get out of here and uh, let you get some rest? Uh, no. Wear a mask. If it, you know, yeah. wear a mask. Yeah. It's not It's not the Rona you got, right? You're not. I don't think so. It's the uh, jackass. We had, you know, you have a holiday. You deserve to suffer. Although I didn't. Yep. I just, it's. A Thanksgiving tradition that even if I don't see anyone, I get sick. Yeah, it's sort of like it's a it's part of your uh, rhythm. It's you know, rhythm, your body's right. yes, yeah, your body rhythm. So go follow Mr. Dominic on Twitter at Dumanuko. His uh, company is at the Mad Botter Inc. Of course, I'm on there too. I'm at Chris L A S, and the network is at Jupiter Signal, where you can get news and announcements about other shows. And of course, if you if you uh, like this show, you might also like to get uh, Linux Action News and Linux Unplugged and self hosted in your feed. So. Go grab the All Shows feed. Links to what we talked about today are at coder.show slash 390. You'll also find our contact form over there as well as subscribe links and our RSS feed so that way you can put it in your podcast catcher of choice. Also, join us live. We do the show on Mondays, but the time will be changing soon. We haven't picked a new time, so I advise you to just check the calendar at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar where when we have picked a new time, we will update it there. So be warned now. It is in the works, and we do love having you live, so I wanted to give you a heads up because we'd love to have you join us over at jblive.tv on Monday whenever we do it and get it converted at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Thank you so much out there for tuning in this week's episode of the podcast. If you enjoyed this and think somebody out there you know might also enjoy it, please do consider sharing the show. And don't forget about that Black Friday sale at coderqa.co, promo code Black Friday, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>